Okay, the fourth and final topic that we need to cover to get you ready for the AP exam is this idea of statistical inference, which there are activities we've been doing in class where we've been collecting data about our samples and then using the data from our samples to predict what the larger population might look like. So, for example, when you drew chips out of the bag and counted the number of white chips, and we then used all that data then to predict what how many chips, white chips, were in the whole bag, even though at any one time you never saw more than 20 chips, you were still able to predict exactly how many white chips there were um, in the whole population, which had uh, exactly 500 chips in there. So this is inference, taking data and making predictions about the whole population. Obviously, when you take random samples, you're going to get different statistics. Just by the, the probability of things, you're going to get different answers. And you've got to be able to calculate different statistics and figure out which of these are valid ones to predict what's going on for the population. So what we need to do is look at the sampling distribution of all possible statistical values to be able to do a statistical inference. So we need to be able to do lots and lots of samples, compare them, then we can make valid conclusions. So we use simulation to do this um, um, and sometimes we just go out and do it, okay? Um, we think of a statistic as a random variable because um, assuming we did a simple random sample, it should be randomly selected who's being chosen for our surveys. And so it's like a random variable, okay? So the idea here is that we're going to look at our population. We're going to take a sample from that population, um, some small part of it. We're going to collect data from that take a look at that data and use that to predict what's going on with the whole population. And so this is uh, the process that we're going to learn, which is called inference. Very important that you learn that. Please make sure to download the notes um, for the, these, this video and the next couple videos as you will be recording the, some of the definitions that um, are important for inference onto that worksheet. And the first one that deals with, the first two words are parameter and statistics, which we did go over in class. Remember, a parameter is some sort of numerical number that represents the whole population. Usually we use a symbol like mu for mean or sigma for standard deviation. A statistic is something that represents the sample. And so if we were talking about the mean of the sample, we use x bar, or the standard deviation is s. So these two symbols are used for the sample. These two symbols are used for the population, and yet they mean the same thing. They're both the mean and standard deviation, okay? So again, to remind you, um, to keep that straight, whenever I use the word statistics, we're talking about the numbers coming from the sample. Whenever I use the word parameters, we're talking about the numbers regarding the population, okay? Um, when we're talking about um, a proportion. Um, we use p to represent the population proportion, and p hat, sort of like y hat, is our predicted proportion. So, um, like in the situation where we were trying to predict how many white chips were in the whole population, we would call all the samples that you guys took p's, p hats, I'm sorry, and we use that to predict p, which is the population. If you remember, all the different samples seem to be centered around 0.22. So um, the average of all those samples was our prediction um, of p hat. Turned out it was very accurate and it didn't actually match p. Okay, so p is the proportion that represents the whole population. p hat is the proportion that represents the statistic. So when you take samples, especially when you take lots of samples, you're going to get a certain amount of variability. You're never going to get the same same numbers in each sample, and so there's going to be a certain amount of variability, just like we saw with our uh, everyone drawing out 20 chips out of that bag, there were lots of different answers. To some people got actually zero chips, to all the way up to some people got eight or 10 chips, white chips in their samples. So there's a certain amount of variability that we account for. Um, the idea here is that if we take lots and lots of samples, the average of all those samples is a good predictor for our population. So we use x bar, which is the uh, average of all the samples, to predict mu, which is the average of our population. Um, and, and that's the, uh, the key component of inference. So like we did with the activity, we took 20 chips out of uh, um, 
uh, population actually had 500 chips and not 200 chips. And we looked at a whole bunch of different samples. What we had on the back uh, window there with all the different post-it strips is a sampling distribution. It's a bunch of samples and we're seeing what um, uh, all those samples look like when we make a graph of it. So a sampling distribution, again, this definition should be copied down on your note sheet, it, uh, is the distribution of values taken by the statistics in all possible samples of the same size in the same population. So if we were to do all possible samples, that would be what we consider the sampling distribution. We did not do a sampling distribution because we didn't do every possible combination of 20 chips in there. We certainly got uh, a feel for what that would look like by doing as many as we did in class, especially particularly the three classes. Um, because it's almost impossible to do a true sampling distribution, we do use simulation to try to imit imitate the process of taking many, many samples. So the idea is that we do do many, many samples, but we use computers or calculators or technology to simulate that process. Um, we'll get into the theory of this later on. So three things things you need to be aware of um, when we when we're ever doing sampling, um, we're looking at the population distribution, which is what the thing would look like for the whole population, and many times that's actually not known. Okay, um, we look at the distribution of our sample data. We look at our sample and we uh, um, look at what that graph might look like, just like we did with the chips and um, everyone put up their post-it notes on the back. The sampling distribution would be imagining if we were to do every possible combination of samples, and we made a post-it note for every one of them. So we would have, you know, maybe a thousand post-it notes up there instead of just 55 of them like we had in class. Then that would be a sampling distribution because it would be every possible combination of 20 chips taken out of that bag. So these are three things that you need to be aware of when dealing with inference. And make sure you copy down the definition for the sampling distribution as that needs to be included on your notes. So I'll give you a, p a picture of what this might look like. Let's say I had a population of color chips, blue and red, in which 50% were blue and 50% were red. So this is the population distribution because I put the number of chips in my bag. I know exactly what it would look like. I put 200 chips in there, 100 red, 100 blue. So here's my picture of the population distribution. I would then take a bunch of different samples, um, each of size 20, and count the number of blue and red chips in each one. So um, this represents three different samples. This one had 12 blue and 8 red. The second one here had 9 blue and 11 red. And this last one had 7 blue and 13 red. So I would get a lot of different answers depending on which um, uh, 20 chips I picked out in each of those samples. And then I put all those samples together to make a sampling distribution. Um, what it would look like if I were to do lot, all the different samples that are possible. And if you notice here, they would have a center here, which this, we would call this p hat, this is our predicted value, that is exactly the same as the proportion of our population. So if we do bunch a lot and a lot of samples, we should be, be, be confident that the center of our samples would match the center of our population. So again, the population distribution is the whole population, the sample distribution is the uh, distribution of all the individual samples, and the sampling distribution is putting all the samples together and making one graph out of it. So when we take samples, we, need, we want to use those samples to make predictions about our population. Um, but we got to be able to trust that the numbers that are coming out of the sample closely mirror what the population is. And we need to look at what's called biased and unbiased estimators. So in our chip example, remember um, I asked you guys all to take out um, samples of size 20 and calculate the number of white chips. And if some of you got really close to 0.22, some of you got real far away. I know some of you had 0.4 all the way down to zero. But when we put all those samples together, we could see the center of it was right around, turned out 0.22. So we call this an unbiased estimator because it does a good job of predicting what happened with the whole population. And so, uh, again, this definition to be included on your note sheet, an unbiased estimator, an estimator is unbiased if the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the true value of the para, uh, parameter being estimated. So if we were to do this sample many, many times, the center of all those samples would match up to the center of our population. To be able to trust any kind of 
statistic that we gather from our sample to make a prediction about our parameter with our population. Um, we need uh, to get, as we mentioned, an unbiased estimator. However, um, how, how do we know when something's unbiased or not? General rule of thumb is that the larger the sample size, the less the standard deviation, and the more precise our answer will be. If you take a look at these two graphs here, you'll see here that this graph has a sample size of 100. And you can see here that while the center is about 0.37, I get anywhere from 0.22 to 0.52. So if I were to take any one of those samples and try to predict the population, I could be as, as far off as 0.15. Because if I happen to get that one that was 0.22, that would be far away from the center. Okay, But if I do samples of 1,000, you can see there's less variability here. Now if I pick one of those 1,000 of them, you can see that I'm not going to be any more, more than 0 0.03 off from the center. Any one of those, for the most part, are going to be very, very close to what the true center would be. So the moral of the story is that the bigger the sample size, the more precise your answer is, and um, the more confident you are that it predicts the total population. So the variability of a statistic, which is something else that you need to include in your notes, is the idea is that basically it's a standard deviation. And keep, the biggest thing to realize is that the larger the sample size, the smaller the spread, the less variability you have, and the more confident you're going to be that your answer is close to being correct. In the first example, um, I picked any one of those. I could be as far off as 0.15 from the center. Where in the second example, if I picked any one of those, you notice the sample size is 1,000, I'm going to be very, very close to the answer no, for the most part, no matter which sample I pick. So we always want bigger sample size. However, there is a limit, and this is a big one here, there is a limit to how, what the size is. We need to make sure that the population is always 10 times larger than the population than the sample. So if you notice, I had 500 chips on there, and your sample size was 20. Sample, if I take my sample size 20 and multiply it by 10, that's 200, you have to guarantee your population is bigger than that. And in my case, that was. So that was a good sample size. However, if I asked you to do a sample size of 60, that would not have been good. Because if I take the sample size of 60 and multiply by 10, I get 600. There weren't 600 chips in that bag. So that's where the, the um, while bigger samples are always better, there is such thing as too big a sample. You want to stay within under 10% of whatever the population is. We call this the rule of 10. We'll talk about this more later on. Once again, copy this down on your note sheet for the variability of a statistic. Okay, when you're looking at sampling distribution, remember, which remember is all the samples put together. It's not in a one individual sample. It's a lot of samples put together. We want to um, check for bias, and we want to see how accurate our sample is, our distribution is, in comparison to the population. And so remember, um, uh, I was talking about that we can um, trust our samples as long as we've eliminated bias. If we have a bias, and this is an example from the first problem here, you can see here I have high bias because it's not on the target, it's way off the target, but low variability. I'm very, very consistent up there. Low variability is usually a good thing. Everything's really close together. So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, my sample has done a pretty good job. I have a large sample size. But if you notice, I have a lot, a lot of bias there because I didn't hit my target. I'm far away from the target. And that's usually a bad thing. We are looking for samples that hit our target and have low variability. So the second one has a situation where, if you notice, the center of it's pretty good. If you see the center of all the dots, it's pretty much on target. But there's a lot of variability here. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of dots that are kind of far away. There's some dots that are really close. So if I were to pick any one of those dots, sometimes I'm going to get close to my target. Sometimes I'm going to get far away because of the high variability. Here's a situation where there's high variability. Dots are spread out all the place. And the bias is there. The center isn't even the right spot. So no matter what point I pick here, I'm going to be long ways away from the target. What we're looking for, and this is the ideal, is to get low variability and no bias. That means we're on target, and all, no matter what point I'm going to pick, I'm going to be very, very close to the true population um, number that I'm looking at, whether it's the mean, standard deviation, whatever it is I'm looking at. Okay, so the idea here is that, and this is the lesson that needs, 
that you need to include in your notes. It says, when using statistics to investigate a parameter of a population, choose a statistic with low bias and low variability. That is the ideal situation. We don't always get that, but that's what we're looking for. Little bias and low variability. Then we know we are on target. Please keep this, these notes for the next couple of videos as you will fill out the rest of this, um, these note sheets as we progress through the videos.